I think setting up in a recession is, is, is the right time to do it because, you know, you really, um, well, you test yourself. Um, you, put it, you have a lot of discipline around what you're doing. You have to bootstrap. The Architects of Business on Joe, in partnership with the EY Entrepreneur of the Year programme, telling the inspirational stories behind Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome back to the Architects of Business on Joe, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, where we hear the inspirational stories of some of Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Sonia Lennon and in this episode I speak with Anne Herity, CEO of CPL Resources PLC, the first ever female CEO to be listed on the Irish Stock Exchange. Anne, thank you so much for coming in today. Um, I'm extra delighted because I'm privileged to call you a friend and we've known each other for some years now and uh, it's funny because interviewing you in advance of this interview, to hear your story from scratch again, it is an unbelievable story. And for those of you listening and watching who haven't heard it, um, it starts like really early, age seven or eight, getting involved in the family business. Yes, well, I grew up in a family business um, in County Longford and the family business being a shop, a farm and um, and we were all, there were six of us in the family, we all worked in the business. So it was the most natural thing in the world. And, and was that, um, was there ever any structure around that or did you just dive in? Well, there was plenty of structure around it because my mother made sure we all worked. <laughs> so okay, she, if, no she, choice. She was just the type of person. She had huge energy herself. If she saw you sitting down, and we still joke about it to this day, if she saw you sitting down for five minutes, it was like, is there a problem here? <laughs> she you were nobbled. She'd find something for you to do. And there was kind of, there was, there was two phases of the family. There was the kind of first block and the second block. That's in, right. in terms of the siblings. Yes. Yeah, so so there, um, my eldest brother, Peter, would be 18 years older than me. So there was Peter, Paddy and Mary. And then there's a gap of five years to my brother, Martin, and five to myself and my sister, Sinead. So Sinead and I were almost like a little family on our own. Round two. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So from the age of seven, it, it focused mainly on the shop, was it? Well, it wasn't even from the age of seven. You know, one of the lovely things about growing up in a family business like that is that just business is all around you. It's the family, it's the business, it's, you know, you're having your meals, people are in and out. Now, some people would hate that, but when it's all you've known, um, That's you your know, normal. it was just lovely the way you blended work and business and it wasn't this separate thing of going to work and a separate thing of being at home. It was all together. But there had to have been siblings who were more interested in, in, in that way of life than others. I mean, it, did it come more naturally for you than others? Oh, it did. I think it did come more naturally for me and maybe for my um, older brother, Paddy um, and Martin. I think the three of us were probably more interested. Um, my sister, Sinead, was always very focused on her golf and it's no surprise that she's ended up making golf a career. Um, and then my and your mother loved golf as and well. my mother loved golf so Sinead too. had an out clause oh Sinead had an out clause <laughs> for sure with her but also too the other thing was you know which is, <laughs> mom if she thought if she had to go to golf and there wasn't somebody to mind us or we didn't have something to do she made us go with her anyway oh really uh, yeah oh yeah okay. we had to go and caddy or do whatever <laughs> you know and where was your dad in all of this then because it sounds like your mother was the driving force in the business um, she was but my um she was definitely the uh, the driving force from a business perspective. My father was probably much more cerebral and uh, he was very, he really um, loved making things. He had quite an engineering, analytical almost type mindset, um, but very supportive of her. They very much, you know, worked as one, really. So, but she was probably more, for, you know, she was a bigger communicator, yeah. a little bit more forceful, I suppose. In the terms extrovert. Of her, yeah. Her communication. So there's probably, you know, quite a bit of both of them in you. Yeah, so I, I expect so. Yeah, I think I probably did have taken a bit of both of their personalities. So, you know, your your dad had had that analytical engineering brain. And when you uh, finished school, you went to UCD. That's right. And I did a degree in maths and economics in UCD. So maths numbers running through your core that's that's definitely you know 
where you were, the business was there, and it's almost like a kind of a combination of that that's brought you to this point now. But what, what happened when you graduated? So I never really, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And, you know, it's interesting for me working in recruitment because, I, you know, I meet people who've known from almost the day they were born exactly what they wanted to do in terms of their career. And then I meet people who, you know, really don't have a clue and are trying to find you know, what's their path. Um, but for me, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do other than I always had this desire to set up a business. I always knew that someday I would be in business. Um, I, you know, even when I was in college, I did the strangest of things. I did a, a start one of these start your own business courses. And with another person I met on the course, we were our big idea was that we were going to take in one of these machines from France that did all the baked potatoes and you could make um, pancakes and all that. And we were going to set it up at the top of Grafton Street. Fantastic. And, you know, that was how we were going to generate I'd, some I'd money through college. I'd pay good money to see you standing at the gra top of Grafton Street baking potatoes. That would have been good fun now. And so well, we didn't do it. What stopped the you then? Um, I don't think we had the money to, Okay, you fair know, enough. It was a great idea until, you know. Couldn't resource it. No. There's a lesson in there somewhere, no. isn't there? <laughs> So, so you, you graduated yeah. and, and what was the next step? So I graduated and then um, thought about doing a postgraduate in law and I started that and I really just, you know, it just wasn't for me. And then I tried a few other things and eventually, um, you know, I tried a few other things. I did lots of odd jobs and things. The one thing was I had to support myself because mm. um, so, so I did lots of odd jobs. And there was never any sense that you were going to go back down and, and stay down in Longford. I would have, I would probably have loved to have done that at that time. But actually, my brother was going to take over the business. That was always the way. Okay. Um, you know, we all understood that from the forever, get go. Really, yeah, from yeah. the get go. Uh, but um, so yeah, um, so I didn't. You know, again, I just did lots of odd jobs, and then I eventually decided that. You know, I needed a steady, serious job. So an income, an income, a proper income. I was all, you know, so I got into sales. I got into sales with Xerox was really my first what I would call proper job. Well, yeah. in fact, I got into telesales with Xerox. And then within a couple of months, I got promoted out on the road with a company car. I thought I was made. Amazing. Yeah. And did you love sales? Was that loved? You it. just found yeah, your I loved it. Your thing. And the training in Xerox was very good, you know. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So um, selling the hardware into offices, is that yes. correct? So <laughs> clunky hmm. typewriters. <laughs> <laughs> Not very space efficient in those no. days, I wouldn't think. So so how did the jump happen from uh, photocopiers and, um, and, and the hardware into recruitment? So I registered with a recruitment, with a couple of recruitment companies. I wanted to change jobs. And um, one of them, a company called Grafton Recruitment, the girl who was interviewing me said, oh, we're looking for somebody in recruitment. Did you ever think about that? And I said, well, no, because I don't, you know, I don't have the experience. I don't know what's required to be a really good recruiter. So she said, oh, well, look, I put you in touch with my boss. And if they think you're suitable, they have a good training program here, and that's a train pretty you. good endorsement, isn't it? To to go to a recruiter and be recruited by the recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> she must have seen the light, something special, you know. Well, we're still good friends. Good. I'm still good friends with that same girl. So all of a sudden, you find yourself an accidental recruiter. Yes, and I loved it from the get go. What so, about it? Did you love? Um, so it combined. Well, first of all. You know, it, it can be such a positive environment to be in. You're seeing people, you know, um, reach their full potential. It's all about people and their potential. So I loved uh, that part of it. But uh, I also, at that stage for me, which was quite interesting, was, you know, I gravitated towards the tech sector. Everybody else in the office, you know, we all recruited everything and every type of person. And very quickly, people started to come to me with their... Um, tech candidate saying, would you know where we could, what we should do with this person? Or, and then I started to interview um, all the tech people. And I just loved the combination of working with tech people, um, the, combination, the combination of working with tech people, 
Um, maths and the science and the, the analytics, you know, the sales, just, everything. I love the ideas yeah. of what they were, you know, the kind of work they were doing. I was curious about how they were developing product and all that. So, so yeah. That. Now, at that time, technology was a very, very emergent sector, sector at that stage. Yeah, it was a tiny sector. I could open the Irish Times on a Friday morning and I could know where every job in the tech sector was, regardless of who had advertised it. You know, you just, you could get your arms around the sector in right. that way. And for me, what I was passionate about then, you know, was with the, my candidates, was understanding like what was a really good move for them, what would really enhance their career. So I very much came at things from the candidate perspective at that time and then and it was at a plotting, later stage. Plotting a career yeah, strategy for them. For them. Yeah. And, and, you know, of course, the great thing about that was that many of the great candidates that I dealt with in those days, some of them went off to set up their own businesses and became soft, software um, or technology entrepreneurs themselves. And then we subsequently ended Absolutely. up working with them. And it's just that lovely um, loop, loop, you know, gorgeous of building that network and building those relationships, which is really nice. So you must have been... Um, with all the sort of attributes at play, you must have been in line to set up the Grafton Technology Division. Well, that's what I had hoped, but it wasn't to be. I had, so I went to my boss and I said to him, look, I think the only way I can do a really good job uh, here is if I build a deep, deep understanding of the sector that I want to work in and that's specialize. tech. I want to yeah. really specialise and build a deep knowledge in the sector. And they wouldn't allow me to do that because they had a belief that we, sh you know, we took every job in on rotation. So I could be looking for a financial controller today and it could be um, a customer service person tomorrow or whatever. And so, so, you know, that just kept niggling at me and I kept thinking, oh, if I could specialise in this, I'd really. So... Eventually, I start, you know, as you do, you start to talk to people about it. And I'm saying to my friends, you know, I'm telling you, there's a better way here. And um, then the husband, uh, then I had started to say, a friend of mine said, well, sure, why don't you set up on your own and do it? And I said, well, that would be fine, except I have no money. Um, so anyway, then another friend of mine, her husband said he'd back me. And Amazing. he already worked in recruitment. So he knew it. So he backed me. Yeah. Amazing. Because thinking about it, specialisation wasn't even really a thing then. Well, no, there weren't really, there weren't really companies, recruitment companies specialising at but that But anybody, time. nobody specialised. Right. Yeah, Whereas now, yeah. you know, we, we, we understand that you're, you know, drilling down into a micro niche of yeah, your own making. Are, yeah, yeah. And, and that's part of business today. It wasn't at the time at all. No, I suppose, no, most, and in fact, yeah, most people, whether they were in management or whether they were, you know, had to be quite generalist. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so you move, so you have, have the backing. I had the foresight, but it wasn't that I had, the, you know, it was just but that. you, you, you kind of did, though. You knew you needed to specialise to be really good in a particular well, that area. That I certainly felt. Yeah. Um, so you, you get a, a pot of money uh, and, and, and a pot of advice from somebody who had worked in recruitment. Is that fair to say? Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So he no, he already had a, a, a recruitment company, and he was specialising in finance and accounting. Right. Uh, professionals. So, so he got it. He got it. Yeah. 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 So early CPL then, um, before the empire. What did that look like? <laughs> Me, a desk, and a phone. Hello, and a CPL. <laughs> <laughs> there are some very funny photographs from those early days. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And it was you on your own. I presume. Yes, at that time, yeah, yeah, to start out as well. And how long did that last? Um, so I think about a year and a half in, we uh, we hired our first person, somebody who was, now, bear in mind that in 1990, unemployment. I love that it was a year and a half before we hired our first person, we being me. me. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, um, but, uh, so bear in mind, unemployment was running at 15%. At the time, so it wasn't a natural time to set up a recruitment company, really. And in fact, my the first person that I hired to work with me was somebody who was himself a technologist, and 
uh, I hired him and I said I'd train him in recruitment because that was sort of building on that e ethos that I wanted somebody with the technical discipline yeah. and then I could train him on the recruitment side. So setting up a business in a recession then, um, speaking as somebody who set up two in a recession, um, that has its benefits though, doesn't it? Yeah, I think setting up in a recession is, is, is the right time to do it because, you know, you really, um, will you test yourself? Um, you put it, you have a lot of discipline around what you're doing. You have to bootstrap. Um, and you know, for and you us, don't have the fluff of um, a bloated context for no. what you're doing. It's bare bones well, stuff, isn't it? Is, it? For sure. And you know, even for us in those early days, it was very much about, it wasn't even so much about, you know, the revenue we were gen generating or anything like that. It was really about the customer. And it was about what we really appreciated were the customers who called you back and recommended you to others. Like they, that was how we measured our success. We got really excited when somebody gave us a recommendation. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that um, because uh, I want to talk about the first client um, when we come back after this break. Okay. The architects of business on Joe in partnership with the EY Entrepreneur of the Year program. So can you still remember your first client? I can remember not only my first client in CPL but my first placement. Wow. When I started in recruitment. Wow. Yeah. And this year, CPL celebrates 30, 30 years, years in, business. in business. And where's that first client now? So actually, they are still a very successful uh, consulting company here in Dublin. Now, sorry, they're, they're much bigger than Dublin, but they still have an office here in Dublin. And they're still a client to CPL. And they're still a client. And what about the first recruit? Do you know where they are? I do indeed. Uh, sorry, the first person we placed? Yeah. Or, yes, I do indeed. Um, and in fact, I, I'm pretty certain that um, the person gave up work, probably. They stayed with that company for about 10 years. Yeah. And then once they had kids, gave up work. That makes me sad. But anyway, we'll, t we'll talk about that another day. We'll talk exactly. about that another day. So you then kind of, um, you, hit a, you hit a roadblock in terms of the dot-com dot crash shortly after you you started is that right well no or was it, no, were you actually, in that when you started so, no so what happened was we we started um early 1990 unemployment was high really tough time then of course very quickly so maybe 1993 94 things really started to take off from a technology perspective there was a whole new wave of industry yeah. came in and um, and boom then time boom for time for tech right up through 97, 98 and, and unemployment fell at a phenomenal rate um, and 1999 we went public and then we come into the dot com um, boom and Y2K and all of that. And you were the first ever Irish female founder CEO to, to list on the stock exchange. So I believe. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so, quite an accolade. Well, thankfully there are much more now. Thankfully you know, indeed. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but, um, so we came into that, that period of time, we had just gone public and that was particularly difficult because of course what happened after Y2K and the dot-com bubble burst was the whole tech piece fell off cliff and we were totally specialist in tech. So what do you do in that situation? So in that situation, you're now in the public eye um, and um, you've taken in ex external investors' money. So as a team, we just got together, right, a good team, we just got together and developed a whole new strategy. We were still very, and still are, very convicted about the need to be specialist and build a deep knowledge of your sector in order to really be um, a good advisor uh, to both your clients and candidates. Um, but we, so we decided to build out a number of businesses in different sectors uh, so that we wouldn't have any over-reliance on any one sector. So that's how CPL ended up diversifying. Mm -hmm. So our, the businesses now that we are strongest in, still tech, uh, uh, technology is a very strong business for us, uh, the farm and life sciences sector, finance sector and healthcare. And, and, you're and we really do all, like we do have other um, sm um, smaller spe specialist niches, but but you know by the nature of the volume and those they're 
they're smaller but still yeah. specialists. So do they almost operate like um, individual companies under the umbrella of yes, CPL? Yes, they do. It's like CPL would be a very entrepreneurial organisation. Okay. And so at that time when it was, when, when, when the doc, Com bubble burst, you know, and you were listed. D did you feel at that time that you were, you know, a hostage almost to 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 the listing? Like, like it must be an added pressure to 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 have those shareholdings and to have that public sort of forum and to be able to deal with that sort of crisis. Well, of course, you're conscious of it, but you know, fundamentally, you know, the thing I knew and the thing I I still know to this day. Um, it's about it's about focusing on the business. It's about growing the business for the benefit of your clients, for the benefit mm. of your employees, and for the benefit of your investors. Yeah, and, and so it's about managing all that stakeholder group, really, which is and, a job in itself. Well, it is, but you know, I think once you, I think you know, once the business does well, everybody does well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, 30 years on, which is again just a, a fabulous story to be able to tell. CPL have such a position in the market um, and obviously deep, deep roots. What differentiates um, CPL as a recruitment company, do you think? Well, I think it's our heritage, it's our values. Um, we're 30 years in business this coming year, so we've built a really deep understanding uh, of how you access talent and where that talent is Located, so I think that's you know, and we're so committed uh, to that whole value around people reaching their full potential. Um, so I think you know that's one of the areas where we play very well. There's a, there's a human. There's a very beating strong heart human it. beating heart to it. Now, alongside that human beating heart, we have always been early adopters of technology. You won't be surprised to hear that. And so, for example, at the moment, we would use um, machine learning and artificial intelligence when sourcing. We partner with some you know, great Irish startups. Um, so the combination of that human piece supported by technology yeah. is very strong. And, and, I, and I think hopefully so. gives some advantage to our clients. Um, and the other thing is our thought leadership mm. um, around the future of work. Yeah around where um, the world of work is going and, you know, keeping ahead on that. And I mean, that's that's an interesting one to me, because certainly in terms of a lot of the speaking that I do around, um, you know, uh, gender equality in the workplace and all that kind of stuff, that there is an element of um, the workplace as, as it stands at the moment not really being fully fit for purpose for anybody, regardless of gender, and that there needs to be quite a lot of rethinking of the structures of work, flexibility of working being one of them. I mean, I presume that's what you're advising your clients on in terms of how they um, make themselves attractive to a, a very um, strong talent at the moment. So we have a future of work um hub and we invite clients in there and we co-create solutions, workforce solutions for cl with clients. Um, flexibility is big, but so are things like diversity and inclusion, health and well-being, mm -hmm. uh, sustainability, how you engage people. I mean, one of the things that really strikes me is that when we look, like not just in Ireland, but globally, unemployment is at such low levels. Like we're, you know, practically full yeah. employment in, in almost all economies. And yet the level of engagement um, from people in work is quite low. Yeah. So, you know, it's a real cha challenge for all of us to understand how we raise that level of engagement because we all know, you know, people who are engaged are much more productive. Uh, you get much happier. better results. They're happier. You know, there's a whole ecosystem around that. Um, so they're some of the, the challenges that we're trying to work through um, with our clients in the future of Work Hub. Amazing. And funny, I, I was um, at a lunch yesterday uh, with um, Kieran from from CPL, who's out in Sandyford Industrial oh, yes, Estate. And he was saying that, you know, when 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 interviewing talent for, um, you know, in today's world, they want to know that they don't have to go for drinks on Friday. Yeah. You know, they, they're not interested in that sort of pursuit yeah. anymore. So with that kind of traditional social aspect gone, it's, I, I guess the big issue is how do you connect people and make sure that they un understand each other as humans, you know? Yeah, that, I mean, that is really important because at the end of the day, 
you know, we have to connect. It's, you know, people do business with people who they have a relationship with. Yeah. And the same thing with your colleagues in the workforce. You know, you get your leads, you build your pipeline, they help you on the delivery for a client. So, they're so, in because they're invested in you. they're invested in you and they're invested in your success. So, so we, need, we really need to be very mindful of um, how we build those relationships. And I would certainly, that would be advice I'd give to anyone throughout their career. Put the work into your relationships. Yeah. It really does matter. Yeah. And I suppose the relationship that you have with uh, EY Entrepreneur of the Year, it's, yeah. it's so d- deep. And so many people have sat on that couch before you as alumni, but you now sit on the judging panel. Oh. Um, and it's a huge part of, of your life, I think, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I have to say it has been a phenomenal experience for me. It's such a privilege to hear the stories of other entrepreneurs, to hear what they've gone through in terms of building their businesses, but also to, to you know, the, it's the creativity. Yeah. It's that solution focus that and they the have. And the agility of it. And the agility yeah. of it. And, you know, you know, everyone's talking about Brexit and global uncertainty and all this. But, you know, Entrepreneurs, were, of course, worry about that, but they think about, you know, the, the, their mindset is, how am I going to get around this? How am I going to solve this? You know, no matter what, you know, the show has to go on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, and so and it's great to be around people with that kind of mindset. It's energizing. Yeah. And so are you learning at the same time? All the from time. From them? All the time. All the time. Um, you know, and sometimes it's just that, bit of advice you get from somebody or the cup of coffee you have with somebody and they're telling you about something and you think, you know, you have that aha moment. So, um, in fact, it's an incredible learning experience every time I meet some uh, another founder or entrepreneur. So I'm sure you're approached all the time for advice, even outside of that EOI forum. Um, I suppose for people listening, what are the fundamentals? And if you could start with a blank page now and do it all over again. For you, what are the fundamentals in terms of setting yourself up for success in business? Well, I think, first of all, you know, I'm going to take it that whatever sector or idea you have, that you have a discipline or a knowledge or a you know, deep technical skill set yeah. around it, what, whatever it is. So let's You take, know what you're talking yeah, about. <laughs> let's take that as a, let's take as a that given. As a given. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think after that, it's about surrounding yourself with the right people. It's it's about self-awareness about your own skills and um, your own capability and then surrounding yourself with the right people. And now that doesn't, all, you know, if it's early stage, that doesn't have to be that you hire um, you build out this big team and hire people in, you know, partnerships, advisors, um, as well as people that you may employ. Um, so I think having the right people around you. But the other thing is to just build your network, mm. you know, build your network through clients, build your network through um, uh, through partners and advisors as well. I think that network is really important. And, um, I, I, and certainly for me, that has been, you know, it has been, it's been people along the yeah. way that have sort of given me a nudge on or, you know, the times when you're not sure about something and they just say, no, you, of course you can do that. And there's networks and networks, right? So it's it's kind of different different roles for different yeah. groups of people as well. Um, and I, we're, we're um, very lucky to be part of a, a small network that yeah. meet four times a year right. to, to kind of unpick problems and and all sorts of issues that we yeah. face um, and I, I think I think people underestimate the value the of power the, of that. and the power of it in terms of shared experience yeah. shared knowledge and and somewhere to vent because I think being an entrepreneur certainly at the start is quite a lonely station yeah it can be and and it can be and that's why you do need support and you do need to have some balance in your life there's no point in being totally successful, but at the same time, leaving a trail of destruction behind yeah. you. Yeah. And I know that um, throughout the, the course of the Entrepreneur of the Year um, programme, more and more women are, are coming to the table in terms of applying for, for the competition. I know you're pretty passionate about that, about yeah. seeing representation. Yeah. What do you think we can do to, to, to bring more women into that arena? Well, first of all, I would have to say that the in the EY program, um, the EY the EOI team 
push so hard every year um, to source and find women entrepreneurs and to their and therefore and you know and for them being and for female as well as male entrepreneurs being part of that alumni network I think gives them great support yeah. um, but I think you know there are lots I think there are actually lots of really strong female entrepreneurs coming through now um, I think they're coming through the universities they're coming through it's in terms of their subject choices in school um, and you know, I think one of the things that that's probably very good for female entrepreneurs is that, um, you know, they have a bit more flexibility. They're a bit more empowered now. Yeah. And I think that's very important. But I think fundamentally it's about your career. It's about deciding, you know, where your passions are and the totality of the commitment, really. Yeah, because it does take real grit yeah. to keep going, does. doesn't it? And is that something that you, I mean, it's it's great because it is becoming uh, more normalised now um, yeah. for, for for women to take up that mantle and, and, and to just go for it. In, in terms of recruitment, are you seeing that coming through in terms of, of um, particularly higher level hires that people are wanting 50-50 uh, panels to come for, for um, roles? you know, equal representation of men and women, that it's coming from the, the, the leadership of organisations? Um, the organisations that we deal with, and I can say this right across the board, what they're interested in is retaining, is ha having the best talent and retaining the best talent. And th so they're pushing hard to keep females in the workplace and always now, or almost always, you're being asked, even at a senior level, please put forward a balanced panel of people. Internally or externally? Internally or externally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is fantastic. Yeah, it's really good to see. And I could keep on going. It's it's so good to talk to you. Um, and thank you so much for coming to join us on Architects of Business today. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks for tuning in to Joe's Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Thanks to all the team here at Maximum Studios and of course to my fabulous guest, Anne Herity. If you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the show to get a brand new episode into your feed every two weeks for free. I'm Sonia Lennon. Talk soon. <laughs>